The first writers in residence came to the James Merle House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merle's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited, staying in his home, a National Historic Landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you. Hi to everyone, near and far, viewers who are with us virtually and viewers who are watching later. It's a beautiful day in the borough and I'm here in the tower room of the Merrill House looking out over the harbor and the sunset and our guest today John Cotter is in the study. My name is Joanna Scott. I am a fiction writer and with my husband the poet James Longenbach I was a writer in residence here at the James Merrill House back in 2019 and we liked it so much that they couldn't drag us away. So we are happily making our home in Stonington now, and I'm on the committee of the James Merrill House. One of the great pleasures of living in Stonington is that I get to meet the current writers who are in residence at the James Merrill House. And I especially like to take walks around the borough with the writers. Walking with John Cotter along Water Street, over to the docks, down to the point, back up Main Street, I learned about the way he thinks. He notices small details. He is interested in just about everything. He likes to ask questions and he likes to tell stories. I also learned on our walk that John grew up nearby in Norwich and went to Norwich Academy. Stonington is one of his old haunts. He used to spend time here with a school friend who lived on Water Street. And as John and I walked around the borough, he told vivid stories about the people he'd met when he was a boy. The same combination of curiosity, candor, and storytelling skill powers his writing. He is the author of a novel, Under the Small Lights, published in 2010, and he has just put the finishing touches on his memoir, Losing Music, to be published by Milkweed in the spring of 2023. The memoir chronicles the complex, ongoing experience of dealing with Meniere's disease, a disease that can profoundly affect hearing, causes vertigo. Uh, John writes about it beautifully. I've had the privilege of reading the book in manuscript form and can testify that it is an extraordinarily sensitive account of illness. Even as he packs the pages with unforgettable stories about his experience of the disease, John asks the most essential questions. How should I live? How should I regulate? my emotional life, he writes, my expectations of the world, when health could be given or taken away so capriciously. In exploring answers to these questions, John offers a beautiful ode to the role of music in our lives. Music, as he says, is not just a series of structured sounds, but the world those sounds created, a world you could live inside. Bach on a snowy afternoon, hard blues on a long winter's drive, the background mood in a restaurant or at a party. Music is color, it's location and weather. You can feel it on your skin. He describes a Bach party debt for a solo violin as vertiginous, sinister, like a dance at the edge of a cliff. He says about music that it fixes nothing but mood, but mood can be everything. Not being able to fully hear what people are saying in a crowded restaurant, he describes conversation. It has, he writes, it has no straight lines. Conversations bubble and then separate into two or three. They ricochet, contact, and collide like a billiards break. John is able to do what a musician does to fix mood. At the same time, he captures a dizzy experience of life. His first novel, Under the Small Lights, has been described as kaleidoscopic, lyrical, captivating, big-hearted. He brings all these qualities to the new memoir. He's used the quiet days at the James Merrill House when he's not being pulled away to go on walks around the borough to finish the manuscript. Uh, the, the book is now officially done, and John will be reading from it today. So please welcome with me John Cotter. 
Hello. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, such a nice introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be in this space. It's an honor to write in this space. Um, I really enjoyed my time here and I have, I'm watching the sunset. You can't see this from the screen, but if I turn to the right, I'm watching the sunset out the window on Merrill's study. And uh, it's probably a better show than what I'm, than what everyone is watching at home right now. Um, anyway, I'm going to start by reading a little bit of the, uh, the book that I've just finished. This will be published by Milkweed Editions uh, probably in early 2023. There's not a, a calendar date yet, but probably in early 2023. So this is how the book begins. September 2008. I was in the car the first time music seemed strange. The instruments less distinct, the vocals less crisp. I was driving a lot that year, two hours total on my commute to work and back up the northern New England coast. I kept needing to turn the volume higher, kept straining to make out the words if they were words or the melody. At first, this felt like an indictment of my memory. Surely the bass was louder. Didn't the voices come in sooner? I blamed digitization or my loud car. Something was missing. Work was Marblehead and home was Boston. On my way south in the evenings, I'd pull over at a public beach or a private beach I could sneak onto, and I'd plunge into the water. Concrete, debris, cut borders on the sand, rebar, reassurance of ruins. And those 40 minutes a day gave me an opportunity to clear my head, let whatever thoughts needed to make it to me arrive safe. The music of the water against the sand clarified my feelings the way music can, gave feeling a pulse. It was early September, the day the ocean disappeared. The September sun was finding its horizon earlier each day and the light was changing as I sloshed out of the water, started toward the parking lot, toweling off with a pink towel that a woman from Nahant had given me when I asked her where I could buy one. The breeze came from several directions at once. That time of year when the water's perfect, the air's a little cold. But I couldn't hear the ocean. I couldn't hear bird calls or traffic. All I could hear was a roar inside my head, a noise so aggressive it seemed to blot out the sounds around me. For months by then, I'd been hearing a ringing noise off and on, an engine or a siren in my ears that rose up unexpectedly and then disappeared. Doctors couldn't explain it, couldn't say how long it would last or whether it would continue or worsen. One minute I could hear as well as always, and the next I'd have to lean in close to hear people, my ear nearly touching their mouths. Everyone knows what happens to sound underwater. The full head echo, the slowed down motors and shore voices. The sound I heard wasn't like that. It was made of several tones, high and low together, like a lawnmower near your ear or a plane not far away. It announced itself with clicks and whistles, changing the pressure in my ears, a kind of a buzzy gravity, a planet made of static. I turned back to find the ocean and I saw it. And once I could see it, I felt it as though I could hear it too. As I would learn in years to come, the brain remembers sounds surprisingly well or convinces itself that it does. And when it wants to tell the story, I can hear, it releases its chemicals to help itself mimic noises the damaged ears have lost. You can hear what's not there, and you can hear what was never there. I worried the ground would start moving. It had been coming out from under me these last year in a, in a sudden vertigo attacks. These seemed connected to the noise, but they didn't invariably pair with it. So I tried to ignore what was happening to me, climbing into my car, turning the music up high to overcome the roar. Inconveniently, that summer, my preferred listening tended to the lugubrious, to music that unfolded slowly with lots of dynamic shifts. All those great ECM recordings of simple and gut-stirring stuff, you know, Gavin Breyer's The Hilliard Ensemble. Repeat the same measure enough and it changes. The softness of the pieces brought me to attention, directed the traffic in my head. Summer weekends, I'd drive down to Hartford and visit my old college friend, Galaski. He'd sit me in his living room, pour me a drink, and walk me through the Led Zeppelin or Smashing Pumpkins that I tried and failed to connect with when it was popular. 
pointing out what had been new and so important and what I'd missed. After a few glasses, I'd, I'd forget most of the details he was so painstaking with, but I loved hearing him talk about it. And I loved the sense that I was learning, deepening, better understanding these things that were so loved. Here we were, listening to the MTV sound together, the one that I struggled to appreciate as a kid. I was learning the shibboleths late, filing them away. On my own, I'd rather hear the blues or pop that doesn't stray far from the blues or jazz or instrumental stuff that was avant-garde in the 1980s and now feels full of what the future used to be. Laurie Anderson, Robert Ashley. For years, I was notorious among my friends for abhorrent taste in music. It wasn't just young friends. 60-year-olds hated what I played in the car every bit as much as 20-year-olds did. We'd be driving along and laughing, and I'd pop in Congolese rumba icon Papa Wemba, and everyone would be patient for a couple of beats, and then somebody would break in with, all right, what the hell is this? You know, And everyone would, uh, would second them, and the CD would come out, and some indie thing would be slid into its place. What I loved about Papa Wemba singing Awa Yokei, the piano version anyway, was the controlled, almost ritualistic swings of passion, the way the piano anticipated and then responded to his cries. And of course, the fact that it was in Congolese, so maybe less than 5 million people on the planet understand the words. Nobody not born in Congo speaks Congolese unless it's a handful of haggard Belgian contractors who can't explain to the locals in French why they're stealing all the minerals. What was that about money? Well, if you want a whole dollar a day, we're always looking for someone to dig through dirt. Since the language was impenetrable to me, and any translation iffy, I was left with pure sound, and I could pour anything into it, any fear or catastrophe, any warning, any yearning. Even if our tastes begin as pretense, they soon become who we really are. And one of the great lessons I'd learned was to periodically try to disrupt that ossification. I'd pick categories of sound and I'd study them, uh, heading off to the library with an empty knapsack and coming home with a dozen CDs of opera or early jazz or whatever was charting. I'd listen to all of them, save favorites, assemble secret playlists. When I started to lose my hearing that summer, about age 30. I could still hear Papa Wemba pretty well. Now in 2022, I pop in my wide X dream hearing aids first thing when I wake up. And those little hearing aids communicate real sound by pixelating it and reconstructing it. The once rich toy piano, sorry, the once rich piano becomes a toy piano heard through a radio on a radio. When the notes begin to fall on top of one another, they blend and muddy. It's possible to pick up the thread, but it comes through memory, not the sound around me. These days I still dance at weddings, but after a few bars of each new song, I have to lean in to ask my wife what it is. Billie Jean, which I used to jog to along the shore, is indistinguishable from static, unless the hearing impaired listener knows it's Billie Jean. Then you can follow the beats and the rhythm falls into place, even if the melody and the sense of the words are lost. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the, I, I guarantee anybody who reads this book will never think about sound in the, the same way. Uh, and, and your creation of, of your recreation and language of, of music, you know, Papa Wemba there is so, becomes so visceral through through your words. I, and I found myself, I, first I wanna say, um, I encourage people, I bet uh, people are, are, who are listening, uh, this is so, your subject is so interesting, you write about it so eloquently. I encourage people to, to write in with, with comments. We'll be fielding comments, questions, uh, as, as we go along. Um, but I, I, I will say that I found myself thinking, well, one, here, living by the sea, uh, the the sense of that sound being so present in so many different ways. We, mm -hmm. we all know it day to day, hour to hour. Just as I was walking up here from my house, I, I stopped to look out over the water and it was mm -hmm. absolutely still. 
So mm-hmm. there, there was almost no sound. Uh, yeah. it, it's so still, but that can change very quickly. But what I'm, I'm struck by, I, I, there, there's a theatrical quality, or you, you, you are so attentive to setting, to light, to, to all the things that come around to organize experience the way we think about experience. And I know you have some experience in theater. Some. So, so what, what is it you refer to it in, in the book? Um, I'm, to what extent did that come into play in the writing of the, the memoir? Are you, are you thinking theatrically? Well, that's a, that's a kind way to put it. Um, there's other ways you could put that, you know. Uh, I mean, yes, yeah, that's one of the nicer ways to put it. You know, uh, I, I, I am, I am the I, I've never been someone who isn't me so it's hard to uh it's hard to step outside and I wouldn't know how someone else would do it mm-hmm. but when I try to when I try to write a scene to picture a scene you know I really try to picture it I really try to put myself back there you know when I was writing about that beach um you know just south of Marblehead you know I would I would close my eyes and I would try to think of everything I would try to imagine everything I would try to imagine what my body was doing in space mm-hmm. you know when I uh it's funny you mentioned the theater because I have this memory of working on my first novel and uh, what I would often do when I was writing fiction is if characters were walking around the room or interacting with each other physically, I would often stand up from the desk and I would often walk around and move in the way that I thought they would be moving just uh-huh. so that I could see how it affected the body. So uh-huh. I could see the muscles were being used. Uh-huh. And, you know, when I write dialogue, I always speak it aloud uh-huh. and, uh-huh. Uh, and I always try to imagine it being spoken. Uh-huh. You know? And I do think I do think having an acting background does help with particularly the writing of dialogue. I mean, I do notice that when I, I teach writing at Lighthouse Writers in, in Denver, I taught at Grub Street too. And when uh, when actors come in or people with a lot of acting experience, always good at dialogue, always, because they know uh, what a mouthful of air sounds like. Mm-hmm. And not everybody does, you know. I mean, I'm sure you know because you teach writing. Some people, when they write dialogue, they just have this piece of information they want to convey, and they just have the sentences and they say, put them in quotation marks, and that's the dialogue. But of course, that's what not what dialogue is at all, you know, because when people talk, they they're trying to hold each other's attention half the time, or they're trying to have two separate conversations. And mouths only work certain ways, and bodies only work certain ways, mm-hmm. you know. When you're reading action scenes in books. Um, you're reading like some Jack Reacher thriller or whatever, you uh-huh. know. You, you know, you're, you're reading about how people are punching and kicking each other. And you think to yourself, well, now, wait a minute, you're doing something with two hands and you just had a third hand that you have doing something, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, and you realize that the writer wasn't standing up. I should indict Lee Child. He seems like a nice man. But you realize that the writer wasn't wasn't standing up and actually physically doing it, you know, actually just seeing what it was like. Uh-huh. Um, it wasn't really an answer to your question. Was no, it? I, it absolutely was. And I would say, and when you say, say, oh, you, you are only you, you cannot be someone else. I, you are, an, I, I'm realizing a quite a talented mimic. Uh, and uh, you are also, your, your awareness is, is, is constantly taking you through space and, and enabling you to imagine a perspective from, uh, a, a different point in the in the room, so it it makes sense that you would stand up while you're writing and and walk around and 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 feel this physically. There's a real physicality to to your description. Um, Adam Glasky is asking, and and Adam, I think you're a character in the book, right? That <laughs> I was just reading about. It. I just yeah. read about sitting in his apartment. Hi, Adam. <laughs> How are you? Uh, so that that's a really good question. What, new sounds uh are there new sounds there are new sounds as the music heard on the radio through the radio that are interesting to you sounds that only you can hear that you want to share write about have written about that's a great question the answer is no uh (laughs) there are are, so so we can move on there there aren't uh not really no uh because really have access to fewer and fewer sounds as time goes on. You know, I have the roar in my head. Um, I I will say that, you know, I did get much better hearing aids recently. Uh, and I, I have been able to, when I play music now, it doesn't sound the way it did before I could hear. But it sounds like something. Mm-hmm. You know, I got James Merrill's record player up and running again, and I put on one of his uh, Berg records. Uh, I was listening to the opera Lulu. 
and I could hear some of it. I could certainly I could hear the scratches and pops because it was an old scratched record. You know, I really enjoyed listening to that. I, I just enjoy, I enjoyed the scratches and pops. It was a pleasure to be able to hear them because with my old hearing aids, they'd be too muddy to distinguish. And I mean, it's funny to think about distinguishing static because static is not the static is not the show, you know, static is the thing in the way of you and the show. It's the glass on the painting, but it was as interesting as the music for me. Absolutely. I'm glad that's on record that you listened to it on his, uh, his record player that uh, Mike, little story about that is when I was staying here one day I was walking past it and the record on there was mysteriously turning no one had turned it on <laughs> no one had turned it off in the record it was Satie and it was mysteriously turning really oh so, yeah there's something special about that record player Oh, I'll bet there is. I found that record that because when I saw an interview with J.D. McClatchy here in this house when he was alive, where he talked about the first time he had dinner with Merrill and he bought he bought him a record as a present, but he, he didn't know what to get him. So he went to record store in New Haven. He said, give me the classiest thing you have. Oh. It was this, the snobbiest, classiest thing for the man who has heard everything. And they gave him this new record of Du Parc songs. And he brought it up here. And I guess Merrill said to him, oh, do you know Du Park? And, you know, McClatchy said, no, I don't. And so he put it on and he said it was magnificent. Well, I think I found the record. Oh, well, incredible. Wow. 78. Wow. And I think that was, must have been, it must have been the record. It was a record of Du Park songs from 78. I mean, how many did they put out in 78? Because I knew yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I get your, your sense. I get the sense that you're, you uh, think of music always in, in a, a, a wonderfully dramatic context it you're, you're thinking of how it's played where it's played when it's first heard when it's heard again and and you write about that beautifully and and, and it's so great to have the, the experience with with Merrill's music folding in here let me let me turn it back over to you and um give you uh, I would love to and I'm sure the audience would love to hear more from the memoir sure yeah, I'll read a little bit more. So you and I, when we were taking a walk, uh, oh, you're gone, you disappeared. You and I, when we were taking a walk, we uh, um, through the the marsh through Barn Island, we were talking about my experience at the Mayo Clinic. So one of the things that I write about in the book, the book's about a lot of different subjects. It's about me losing my hearing, but it's also about um, a lot of other things too, right? I went to live at a homeless shelter for a while and learned a little bit about you know, real loss. And that's in the book. Um, uh, Jonathan Swift, uh, the, you know, 18th century satirist and novelist had a very similar condition to my own. And I write about that in the book. One of the things I write about in the book is I was trying to find, I was trying to find a cure for this condition that I had. I was trying to find a cure for what was going wrong with my ears. I couldn't find one in the end. Uh, but I didn't know that at the time. So I went to the Mayo Clinic and this is a, this is a little bit of writing about when I was at the Mayo Clinic. Once the nurse had my clothes off and had positioned me on a gurney at the entrance to a man-sized toaster, she began to sprinkle me with powder, beige stuff, face to toes, and then smooth it in like you would a dry rub. Uh, my hearing aids were tucked in a closet. I felt panicked without them. Everything off, she'd repeated, directing me to the changing closet. This clarified the role of the hearing aids. They were an appurtenance only, non-essential. They weren't like the cow membrane I needed to have grafted into my spine as a teen or the titanium bar fastened to the bones of my wrist after a fall. They didn't make me transhuman. They could be broken with ease, lost or taken. I stared up at the nurse, but the fluorescent light didn't silhouette her. It was clinical light in a white room but the sterility of the place was necessary. If I wanted a cure for this thing that had happened to me, I had to diagnose it first, and that diagnosis required all white rooms. She said, you'll be able to wash the powder off later. With luck, it will have changed color by then. A change in the color of the powder would be accomplished or not by heat. Heat that would emanate from the toaster, a walk-in box adorned with tin foil and bare joints. The nurse, I never got her name, wore gloves as she dusted me, the powder less coarse than I imagined before it covered my skin. I felt like a pharaoh on the slab, being rubbed with natron salt before I was wrapped. Tense, I tried a joke. Uh, I had trouble hearing my own voice, so I tried joking in a bar voice. Hey, is that thing going to pop me out the top when I'm done? She gave me a look, 
and implied she'd heard every joke a naked man can make and she hadn't cared for one of them. So, okay, you wheel me into the machine and then what happens? She kept her eyes on the spots where my torso connected to the gurney and she'd missed them on the first pass. Then we test the brain's response to heat. My whole nervous system though, right? The autonomic pathways? Well, she said, as though that were the last word, I guess you've already read about it. I'd only scanned Wikipedia on my phone in the waiting room. I still didn't understand the powder. It turns purple, she said, if you sweat right. She was correct. I did end up uh, a giant purple bruise um, or a carnival dancer, but that was still to come. As she worked the powder up around my ears, I asked, what sort of diseases would make me not turn purple? Oh, she said, as though putting the subject to bed for good, all kinds of things. Medical personnel are very good at explaining things in either the simplest or the most complex terms possible, but little in between. Jargon has a lot to do with this, but so does a vague contempt for patients that develops as a byproduct of guarding yourself against emotional collapse. If you don't have time to cry about everything, you'll end up compensating with a roll of your eyes. There's additional reason for all those zero to 60 explanations. Uh, it's one we hesitate to talk about because we actively fear it, but that doesn't make it any less real. Often, Doctors and nurses and technicians, medical journals and studies and pop science are bad at explaining things because the embarrassing truth is that none of them understand what's going on. Around certain diseases, particularly those of diagnostic exclusion, diseases unverifiable through tests, there exists a hearty portion of bluffing. Whatever was wrong with my ears or brain or nerves, Whatever caused me to collapse and the world to spin around me, caused all external sound to disappear without warning and take on a jet engine roar that only I could hear, was one of those mystery conditions, the kind no one wants to admit being baffled by. Consequently, I saw a fair bit of bluffing at Mayo Clinic. And no one shocks as readily as a cynic, so of course I was shocked by it. What kind of music do you want in the chamber? the nurse asked, removing her beige powdered gloves. Whatever you play, I won't hear it too well, so just play your favorite. She wheeled me into the device. Through a window to my right, I watched her manipulating the dials just then as the red bars lit above me and my skin began to prickle the way skin does on a hot beachy day. I heard music coming very faintly from a speaker above. It dawned on me that I ought to have said, play anything except Frank Sinatra. But there it was. Come fly with me, come fly, we'll fly away. I'll hold off of reading more for them. I love that. We want you to keep singing, John. <laughs> I'm reminded the, uh, uh, the today when I was driving, I heard the Elvis Costello singing just like Frank Sinatra, singing She. Oh, yeah. oh. Achingly beautiful. The uh, that was one stern nurse, and I laughed at your joke. So that well, thank you very much. Something. It didn't go over in Minnesota. You know, every it was really cold when we were at Mayo Clinic. They were it was 2014, early 2014, and this polar vortex was sitting over the Midwest. And it was one of those things where they, you know, you'd hear announcements on the radio where they'd say, don't go out of the doors alone. You know, always have a buddy with you when you're outside. Ah. Try not to be outside for more than five minutes. Because, you know, it's considered with wind chill, it was extremely cold. And I think it made everyone very stern because oh, you know, didn't want to joke while I was there. Mm -hmm. You couldn't joke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the... But, you know, you know you're, 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 it's kind of oh, a fascinating take on the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and, and I know how frustrating it is. Have, a rare person who hasn't had some version of this, of not being able to figure out what's wrong um, and, and to, to go through so many tests and, and not come away with a conclusion, with a diagnosis is very tough. We, we need that answer. We need that, that conclusion. Now, I, I'm wondering, at, at, you, at one point you write, you imagine saying to the nurse, I want my old life back. I, I want not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, as you're pulling away from 
uh, Rochester, Minnesota, you're you're looking at the plane and thinking, I, I just wanted to take everything in. I looked around trying to take everything in. There's such an, you, you end that chapter with such an openness and, you know, in the midst of it, it it's so difficult as, as you are realizing that, that the answer is, uh, the cure, it, it's not there for you. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm wondering in the very, and, and I, in a way this popped up in a, a question that just came through, in thinking about memory and memoir, what, I, what is changing for you? What are you learning as you're writing about this experience? And I, I think about your, your very bold transition moving from fiction to memoir. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, hearing, seeing some, some, you have the fiction writer there at work in the, in the memoir, but it's, it's completely new also. And, and I'm wondering what, what sort of discoveries were there and, and did in the very writing of it in the treating of memory, did you start to think about? Oh yeah. Those well, memories in a different way or the, the experience of, of sound yeah. in a different way? Well, do you feel as a writer, I mean, I feel this way. I don't know when you write nonfiction, do you feel like sometimes you don't really know what happened until you write it? I mean, I feel like sometimes when I'm out in the world, I experience reality as just this rush of sensation, you know, just people saying things and there's this, this, this sight, this sight, there's a conversation now that I have an emotion that I'm being gripped by and oh, I'm somewhere else and it's night, you know, and uh, when I'm writing, I get to put a shape on it. Mm-hmm. You know, and by putting a shape on it, when it's nonfiction, of course, you have to, you just have to go by what happened, but you decide where to put the frame, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. you decide where to hold the picture and what to leave in and what to leave out. And something about the process of doing it, that sorting, that quality of sorting mm-hmm. um, enables you to narrativize it, mm-hmm. re-narrativize it, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? Let's go around with the story we're telling each other. Uh, we're telling each other. We're telling ourselves all the time about the meaning of what we're doing. We always have to have a story for the meaning of what we're doing, regardless of what the day is. You know, I wake up here at the Merrill House and I get up and get a coffee. And the story is I'm getting the coffee so that I can go upstairs and do some writing. You know, mm-hmm. and then I'm back from writing, and then I want to take a break from writing, so I have to tell myself a story about why. Oh well, I, I've got to make sure I go out and buy some groceries before everything closes. You know, so I better go out and do that. We're always telling ourselves these stories. Well, the problem is, you know, when my health started to go, the story I was telling myself. It was a very dark story. It was a bad story. It wasn't a good story. You know, the story I was telling myself was, this is it. Mm-hmm. You know, you're mm-hmm. at the end of the road. Mm-hmm. Your, your hearing is going to collapse. Your life will continue to disintegrate because as this illness got hold of me, got its grips into me, you know, I lost my job. I lost, I lost a lot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, you think you'll just keep on losing. Yeah. And- yeah. You, you treat that beautifully. Uh, you you uh, look hard at yourself. Um, but it it, it 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 never is disheartening to to read about. It's a, it's a story of real courage, perseverance, um, and, and willingness to be be candid. And uh, they, you know, I, I think of uh, it, it, as I think about the whole book. I'm reminded of that book by Susan Sontag, kind of formative book about illness. Illness is metaphor, and and she it's a cautionary tale about how we use language mm-hmm. to accuse those who are mm-hmm. ill, especially with, with cancer. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the language we use to talk about it becomes somehow mm-hmm. finger pointing. Uh, it, mm-hmm. it, the person with cancer becomes responsible somehow for the illness. Never in your book do you write about illness, in, in all the lyricism of the book, it, that there's no metaphor that is accusatory or or that that doesn't recognize illness as being something that's that's given by happens by chance. In fact, that the book begins with a doesn't it with a quote about chance, the role that's of chance in our lives. That's right. I don't have the quote in front of me, but yeah, it's. Um... It's from this terrific novel, The Sickness, and the quote is, you know, it's a surgeon saying, why do people find it so hard to accept that life is pure chance? Uh-huh. You know, he says in the white light of the operating theater as he leans down with the scalpel, and then he repeats himself, why do they find it so hard to accept it's pure yeah. chance? <laughs> you know? uh, well, I certainly, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's contingent. A lot of things are contingent. Mm-hmm. And I, that's something that I had to 
You know, I think people like to think things happen for a reason. And even in a secular world, they want to think that reason is, well, some unconscious Freudian thing. That's the reason, you know, you're calling something upon yourself. Or they, or they like to think that the universe is organized such that everything happens for a reason. And people find comfort that way. You know, whether they're they're analyzing themselves to find the secret motivations and wellsprings of their actions, or whether they're feeling comfortable with the events that take place, sometimes the terrible events, because they think a higher power is directing it. And even in, you know, in Colorado, Colorado can be a very sort of woo-woo place. And, you know, I would often say to people, I'm losing my hearing, and they would, you know, these people were very mystical. And they would say, hmm, is there something that your, your body is telling you that it doesn't want to hear? Is there something mm -hmm. here? You know, mm -hmm. uh, people would say, "Oh well, I think we have so much control over this. You know, we just need to. You just need to, um, you know, get some cranial sacral work done or some. You know, mm -hmm. people tell themselves this because it helps. But the thing that helped me was none of these things. When I tried to think these things, it didn't help at all. Mm -hmm. What helped me was the realization that there wasn't any meaning to it. That there wasn't any meaning to what was happening to me. That it was pure chance." Mm -hmm. You know, just as we don't deserve the good things that happen to us, we don't deserve the bad things that happen to us, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, things just happen. Mm -hmm. and once I realized that, it kind of opened up this field of meaning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that whatever meaning the experience would hold would be the meaning I brought to it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as opposed to the meaning that was inherent to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? That... that it, it, you, you write about that and you do that in the book. There, there's the, the organizing of, of the experience that, that is always inquiring, uh, mm -hmm. driven by curiosity and, and interest. But I can tell there is the, the, the need to make meaning out of mm -hmm. the experience through a process of organizing. Yeah. Um, and we need language to, to do that. We need to tell our stories to, to do that, absolutely. So, so the book is uh, in some ways about storytelling, about the, the making of, of meaning. I, I wanna be, make sure you have time. I know you have uh, another excerpt that, that you were going to read. Yeah. So, so I didn't... Uh, let me turn it back to you. Sure, yeah, I didn't wanna read it all at once because uh, you know, 20 minutes is a lot for one person reading. I want to give people time to, you know, stand up and walk, stretch their legs and, you know, get a, get a glass of wine or practice the aerial silks or whatever. They, okay. So this is, this is from later in the book. This is from uh, second half of the book. Um, so one of the ways that I kind of dealt with um, these things that were happening to me is I thought in terms of... Uh, well, it's a chapter about um, people who change a lot. It's a chapter about things that change a lot, right? People who are living one kind of life and then they live another kind of life. You know, I begin this chapter talking about a teacher that I had uh, as an undergrad in college, uh, as teacher Peggy, and she made reference one time as she was teaching the class to a former life. She said, uh, she was telling some story of something she did, and then she said, oh, well, that was, that was in a former life. And I remember she was about 38 years old. And at the time, of course, I'm 18. At the time, I was disgusted by this. I thought to myself, like, a former life. Come on. You're only 38. Come on, come along now. Surely, you know, surely you're simply being dramatic. Surely you're trying to impress a bunch of undergraduates. You know, how gruesome. But, you know, uh, I learned more about Peggy's life. And, you know, she'd married very young. And her first husband was... Um, badly injured in a car accident and he turned to drink and they divorced themselves they you know they had a divorce and she was making her own way adjuncting in a basement in boston and i thought to myself my god it really must have felt like a different life you really can live separate lives in one life and now of course i felt like i've lived several so i i um that's what this chapter is about the chapter is called other lives there are days when the tongs and bones in my head fade to something unobtrusive a background fringe on some of those days, my hearing loss falls from severe to mild. Last time uh, I had it tested on such a day, I could make out 88% of the words the audiology tech spoke aloud, compared to 33% on a day that was worse. People with that level of hearing loss often get by without devices, and I can take them off sometimes too, maybe five times a year. 
At Bardo Coffee Shop on such a day, one of the best days, I put down my swift research and take off my hearing aids, and the room sounds more real than a dream. Voices don't just carry information, they carry subtlety. A woman playing cards with her boyfriend laughs against him, and I can hear the difference between indrawn air preceding a laugh and indrawn air preceding speech. I can hear both his, I guess I gotcha, half whistle inhale and the stomp of her foot as two different sounds, not as one confusing sound. Background music is glorious. All year, I've only encountered it as an obstacle, something that would keep me from conversation, keep me from my thoughts. Now I remember why it's there. It doesn't get in the way. It just creates a mood. This stuff is some kind of C-grade reggae, but I love hearing it. I love the faraway shout. It doesn't keep me from hearing the old student calling my name across a room. I walk better as I rise to say hello to her. How much more open spaces seem when I can hear the whole range of sounds in a place. The echoes of sound, low ones, high ones, bouncing off surfaces, orients us in space. We don't take that extra step back because we can hear someone approaching behind us. Sound is kinetic and we use it to feel as much as hear. Three years ago, when my symptoms intensified, I remember reading a comment on a many years chat room where the author, from the depths of intractable vertigo, lamented her lot. I've started hating the good days, she wrote, because they remind me of what I've lost. I nodded yes as I read, but only from indignation. I couldn't see how anyone could resent a good day. My student turns out to have a head cold. I can hear the catch in her sinuses, the rustle of newspaper folding up, the whisk of a Kleenex from a plastic pouch, the two-note talk of a ceramic cup she sets on the varnish wood of the table. All of them stand out on their own. All of them convey information. None of them are distracting or aggressive. None pull me away from my train of thought. All of them welcome me into the world. And I'll read one more little bit. This is uh, toward, This is from the same chapter. I'm, um, I was staying for a little while to write uh, in an apartment above an art gallery in Portland, Maine. And there was a show downstairs. I wasn't ever nuts about punk rock shows. Uh, they were fun if you abandon yourself to the thrashing, but I, I couldn't keep that up for long. My thoughts dream off into the distance and then return to me in different shapes. I like music for exactly that reason, the way it carries thoughts off and returns them. But punk music seemed to keep them from coming back, wall them up in the noise. That used to panic me. There's a punk show underneath me tonight in the gallery downstairs from where I'm staying in Portland, Maine. I'm not wearing hearing aids, so the music is faint. The bass, on the other hand, feels reverberant. Fish have sound receptors along the length of their bodies, but humans only feel bass in their whole bodies when those bass notes are awfully loud. So when the strings of the bass are strummed, those strings vibrate. The pattern of those vibrations feeds down a wire that hums before a sympathetic magnet, creating a magnetic field. That signal travels along new wires to the amplifier, which in turn vibrates the diaphragm of the four QSV, QSC subwoofers strategically positioned around the gallery downstairs. Tonight, Peter tells me, is the first night all four of them will be online. As the band, a local outfit called Mouth Washington generates low tones with bass drums and strings. The subwoofers vibrate at those frequency, launching cyclic ripples through the air around the stage, the bodies of the listeners, and the wood floor beneath my chair. The floor beneath me becomes a diaphragm, reverberating with loud, complex waves. The air in the room moves invisibly, distance between the peaks of the waves flattening as they swim toward the roof. Standing on the floor above a concert feels like sitting in a car. The vibrations make me feel as though I'm traveling. I'm fascinated by all this movement in a room that was quiet 10 minutes before. The violet tipped beak of the toucan on my coffee mug vibrates along with the unfinished desk it's resting atop and the plywood floors beneath it. 
The old metal chair where I'm sitting vibrates too, and my body vibrates. I conduct the sound. Bass guitars are capable of playing as low as 36 hertz, a sound at the far low end of what humans can hear. When those waves mix and fray, they can reach lower still. Thanks to the subwoofer's 130 decibel power, they can perfectly replicate the sound of thunder and its own vibrations. Movement blurs the room. The sense of urgency holds me still. It can't get out of my head. And then my body surprises me, responding with vertigo. The lighted kitchen counter I can see from where I sit and the lima bean colored wall behind it trail off to the right together and keep moving. They travel right, right, somehow returning to move again as though a photograph copied itself at a rate twice that of a resting pulse, each new copy fanning rightward, vanishing into what? On another night, this would panic me. I'd be panicked if I was working on a deadline or if I had evening plans or if I had to do anything the following day that required concentration. But I'm not panicked now. The vertigo is not bad, for one. I can walk as though on a tossing ship. The waves aren't strong enough to toss me overboard. Was this a wave effect of the notes downstairs? A certain frequency reverberating through the fluid in my damaged ears? the same way buildings can be taken apart by sinister frequencies of wind. Every glass can be destabilized by the right frequency. Can every Meniere's addled ear? Or was this merely a trick of the eye that went too far? In the same way a moving car, viewed from a car at rest, can trigger mild vertigo from time to time. Did the movement around me startle my ailing vestibular system into panic? I don't know. I can't know. I haven't met a doctor who's curious enough to run a test. So the question plays out in my mind where it can play for as long as it likes. I'm content tonight to watch the room hum away from me, the motion of waves coursing through every cell of my body at 300 meters per second. I don't panic. And then my next life begins. I love that you end with beginning there. That's it's really, really stunning, John. It's, it is uh, so generous. So you, you are so willing to uh, give your experience to the reader. That's all I got. <laughs> well, well, a lot of people aren't willing to give it away. So there you go. Um, and thinking about how you're telling these stories, it, there's such, again, physicality, the, the motion, the pressure, uh, the sound becomes a very full experience for you. And in fact, there, there are um, some questions here in the, the chat that mm -hmm. I would like to get to, um, some really interesting questions. And I, uh, in, in, Thinking about music, um, Latrell Bradford asks, music is a feeling for you as opposed to sound. Do you, so are you remembering the sound, therefore that remembrance feeds the feeling? It, it trying to uh, mm -hmm. figure out that, that connection yeah. between feeling and the, the mm -hmm. physicality of the experience of, of yeah. hearing. That's a good question. You know, uh, an interesting thing about losing your hearing is that, um, and, and wearing things like hearing aids, hearing assisted devices and so forth, is that it's easier to hear music that you know than music you don't know. Mm -hmm. So if somebody were to pick up a guitar and play a song I didn't know, I wouldn't make much sense of it. Mm. If someone were to pick up a guitar and play a song that I know really well, I would hear it pretty well. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because my brain basically already has the pattern. Mm -hmm. brain knows what to do with the information. Mm. It's made me wonder how much just talking, just existing in the world is the brain reminding you, oh, that's the ocean. It should sound like the ocean. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a plane. It should sound like a plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like the way that the stranger who looks oddly familiar 
when you suddenly realize it's your friend that you haven't seen in years becomes much more specific than they mm -hmm. were before you realized it was that person. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in the same way, I think sounds are only partially happening in our ear. I think they're happening a lot in our brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, Sean uh, Cassidy asks then, how is the memory of music and replaying songs in your head now? Is it is it satisfying to have that reverie or is it frustrating in a way? I, I, you write about this in the book, but. Like yeah, I mean, it, I'm in a fortunate position now because, you know, the happy ending here, the temporary happy ending, but I mean, every happy ending is temporary, right? I mean, there's no permanent happy ending. There's a reason stories stop. There's a reason comedies stop at the happy ending. It's because something else is going to happen that's maybe not great. Um, at the moment, my hearing has, uh, the, the drop in my hearing has more or less stabilized. Now, it's stabilized at a fairly low level. Um, but it's not getting dramatically worse at the moment. So what it means is my ears are having a little time to adjust to the hearing aids. You know, most people who, who wear hearing aids, their hear is hearing is dropping at a fairly constant rate. And so their ears and their brain have time to adjust. Well, my hearing was rising and falling so much for so many years that I, we have, uh, you know, this neuroplasticity, we have this ability to map you know uh, our brain has the ability to map new regions onto new things but it was happening too quickly for my brain to do that well it's slowed down enough now that my brain is starting to do that mm -hmm. so uh particularly with music i've already heard before when i when i play it you know with my hearing aids i can make sense of it i can hear pretty well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know um even if partial even if part of that hearing happens in my brain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, i mean you know anybody who's ever had hearing is prone to earworms and they're the same, you know, if I have an earworm, if I have a song going through my head, man, that's exactly the same for me as it is for you. Right, right. right. You know, the difference. Yeah. The, you, you just treated this, and maybe I can get you to say a little bit more about it. In writing something about something that is ongoing, as opposed to writing about mm -hmm. something that happened as a, as a, and is over, how do you end it? How do you choose... Where to where to close it? How do you how, when mm -hmm. do you walk off stage? That was a problem when we were when we were looking for a home for the book. We would show it to people and they would say, "Okay, it's a bunch of different things that are happening, and that's interesting." But you need an arc, and you and I talked about this at the at Barn Island. And then we'd say, "Okay," and so I'd I'd take it back and I'd rewrite it, and then we'd show it around again. We say, well, "What do you think now?" And people would say, well, "It's pretty good. It needs an arc, though. It really needs an arc." Mm -hmm. And we'd say, "Okay, okay." So we take it aside and we'd, you know, it, people, you know. <sighs> It's understandable why people want happy endings, right? I mean, life only doesn't give us so many of them, you know? I mean, uh, so when we read, we think, well, for Christ's sake, if I can't have a happy ending in my life, the least I can do is go and buy a book at the store that has a happy yeah, ending. That's right. That's it's, what it's, yeah. I mean, it's a reasonable thing to want, you know? Uh, I'm sure Beckett's not flying off the shelves these last few years. <laughs> you no. Know? Uh, so I, uh, so, it, but it was tricky for me because the, the only happy, the happy ending is not, Oh, I got better. You know, people read uh, about an illness and they think, well, I want to read about how I got better. I didn't really get better. So then, you know, it becomes, uh, and I didn't want to write that I was happy that it happened to me because I'm not happy that it happened to me. It happened. There it is. Mm -hmm. But I've adapted to it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I've learned to live with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm able to operate in the world, you know, even though I'm impaired, I do a little bit less than mm -hmm. I used to, but, mm -hmm. uh, that I'm still alive, I'm still living, and time is still passing. It's yeah. Passing. Well, isn't the adapting part of the writing, and mm -hmm. that that kind of adapting then becomes mm -hmm. gives the story the shape of an of an arc. That's right. And 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 creates a kind of ending that is perfect, a beginning. For you. Absolutely, and you know, I'm sure it's the same for you. You you sit down to write a book, and you're going to stand up having finished the book, a different person mm. in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it takes, a, it takes a year to write a book and then, or more. And then as you're writing this thing, stuff changes, you change, life changes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I started writing this book, man, I was in a dark place. I was in a real low place. I was in a real bad place. Mm -hmm. And I was just dragging myself. I mean, for years I didn't write when I was sick. I was just too upset. Mm -hmm. And I was, the way I got started writing the book with my wife's encouragement, I have to, she was very important to me. She would encourage me to 
you know, go to the, go to the desk and just write a paragraph every day, just write a paragraph. Mm -hmm. And the first paragraphs I wrote were very disconnected, just a bit of this and a bit of that, a bit of this. Sometimes it was just, you know, as simple as writing about trying to meditate and failing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. writing about trying to go on, sit at a coffee shop and get a coffee, but I got dizzy. So it didn't work. I had to come home. And then gradually you say to yourself, okay, if you're a writer, you say gradually, how can this material attain some kind of shape? Mm -hmm. And the only shape that made sense to me for a book like this is I wasn't getting better. I didn't have that, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to end in a marriage. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is a marriage in the book, but it takes place in chapter three. And then, you know, going on. So I thought, well, I have to approach it as a series of different doors that we're walking into along this hallway. You know, and in one door is the story of Jonathan Swift's life and his experience with the disease. And then behind another door is um, a story from my past and how that story relates to what's going on. And then behind another door is, you know, a uh, story of this play that I was directing while I was losing my hearing and the experience of doing that. Mm -hmm. And then after you put these different rooms in the hallway, that's when you can go and see if there's any doors between those rooms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a, a great metaphor and, and very apt right now because you're behind a door. Uh, in fact, you're you're the, in, in the Merrill apartment here is behind, uh, it's, it's a bookshelf that's a secret door that leads into Merrill's study. Uh, so there you are. And, and there, I think in, in, I, I, a ton of really interesting questions have come in and, and, and John, I think you've, you've answered some of them in, in mm -hmm. uh, this, these most recent um, responses. Uh, so I guess, you know, in, in thinking about endings, um, I'll, I'll ask you, uh, you're, you're, you're over there behind the, the hidden, the, the secret door, uh, surrounded by Merrill's books. Um, both of us, we happen to, uh, we're, we're fiction writers who live with poets mm -hmm. we're married to poets and and there you are in a poet's library mm -hmm. and i the question has come in from david lawrence what i uh, are there other surprises in this apartment as uh you've been spending time here working here thinking here reading writing mm -hmm. well it's been interesting to me because you know merrill died in 95 and that was I was a freshman in college in 95 and it was right around the time when I was starting to pay attention to the literary world. So, uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the books on this shelf are books that were predate my interest in that kind of thing. But every once in a while, you know, I'll find something that, uh, I've been meaning to read anyway. <laughs> and I was sitting down with a book of Larry Levis's poems last night and, um, it might've, it's a hard thing to articulate because I'm right in the middle of it. But reading uh, Larry Levis's poems and the way I love, he's one of my favorite writers and the way, uh, you know, through, through one line, he'll, he'll transform the nature of the poem, the quality of the poem into some other, into some other sort of story. I, um, he had this wonderful line in his poem. Uh, how did it go? He said, so I imagine a delicate rain is eating its way finally into every stranger I know. And I walk out into rain past the bars filling with men, past the palm readers in the thrift shop where someone goes on quietly polishing, shining the shoes of the dead until they look almost like new. And as I was reading these lines, I thought to myself, oh shoot, I think I know what I can do in chapter two of the novel I just started writing. Oh, how wonderful is that? Wow. So I put the book aside and- Yeah, and yeah. Here. Yeah, the things that go on in that study <laughs> mm -hmm. behind yeah. that that secret door. Yeah. Um, well, there, there. I I hope you have a chance to read the comments. They're really lovely um, responses to your your reading, John. We miss you as an audience. They people out there. I wish we could we could uh, see you, but um, thank you for uh, being uh, with us today. Thank you, John, for. Uh, sharing your work with us for your wisdom your your generosity has been so fun to get to know you and well uh, thank you so much joanna for for talking to me today
and for reading the book and for saying such, you know, such kind of thoughtful things about it. I really and agree. I think we have a few more walks in the future, right? I hope so. <laughs> things to explore. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. And special thanks to the James Merrill House for giving us this wonderful resource. The first writers in residence came to the James Merrill House 25 years ago, shortly after James Merrill's death in 1995. Since then, over 80 writers have visited, staying in his home, a National Historic Landmark, to work on projects of their own. Thanks to Merrill's generosity, the house now belongs to the Stonington Village Improvement Association and is an ongoing inspiration for writers and poets from around the world. For more information, visit our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. Thank you.